Thank you for tuning in to Tuesdays with Andrea podcast. Today, we are talking to Mr. Jeremy Nixon. He's an assistant vice president at State Street, which is a leading global provider of financial services to institutional investors. And he's located in Los Angeles, California. We're also, we, we met in college way, 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 way back. So it's so good to see you. Thank you for joining today. Take off like two of those ways. We're not that, we're not that old yet. Oh my, all right. <laughs> but don't you feel just a way, little way. bit? Just wait, just my way, 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 way past. It wasn't in my way, way, way past. Just my way, way past. <laughs> just a way past. But it's good to see you. It's great <laughs> to, see to see you. As well. And um, thank you for joining. So we're going to talk today. We're going to get to know your story, your rise, and also talk yeah. about being black in corporate America. Right. And we can do that. And, we can definitely do that. And your perspective. So let's start off. So you just moved to Los Angeles. Do you work um, in the financial services industry? Are you having a good time so far? I'm having a blast so far. Like I said, I was born and raised in Chicago all of my life. Uh, you probably knew that before as we met in college. And uh, about three years ago, I up and moved to uh, California, uh, Los Angeles, California, to be exact. And I took a job with uh, State Street. And I don't think I could have made a better choice in my life. Um, it's, it's been more than a blessing. It's been a blast, um, both uh, professionally as well as personally. It was uh, just the move I needed to be able to sort of expand and to uh, just spread my wings and really, really see what I was made of. Really see what you were made of. What made you jump ship? Uh, there were a few reasons. There are a few reasons. There are a personal reason or two. But well, uh, any you answer. care to divulge? <laughs> uh, no, that was a little personal. You know, one of the big reasons there was that it was a big career opportunity for me, and I think I just sort of missed my, uh, not missed. I think I think I hit my ceiling uh, in Chicago. I think I had accomplished everything that I wanted to in Chicago, and I had never saw myself moving outside of Chicago. But the opportunity presented itself. And you I took was, it. Uh, Persuaded to move to LA. Yeah, and, persuaded. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, you were formerly with what CME Group, right? Yeah, I was formerly with CME Group. I was there for about ten years, maybe a little uh -huh. bit more than ten years. But uh, was there for the Chicago Mercantile Exchange Group, and that's where things started for me. Graduating from college, which was Illinois Institute of Technology, uh, and uh, I was there for ten years. And so, I think it was just time for me to just make that move. You know, sometimes CME Group was a great company, but I think in order for me to grow in the way that I was uh, desiring to grow. I think it was uh, good for me to just sort of get a fresh new start somewhere else and tackle some new challenges at State Street and Los Angeles presented that to me. So I yeah. took it head on and here we are today. And so what's California like? What's, what's LA scene? Is it so much <clears throat> different than Chicago? You know, it's a, it's a little bit different than Chicago. The food can't be that. It, it, the food's not better, is it? Not at all. The food can't compare at all. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I first moved out to the Los Angeles, that was my biggest complaint was that the food was just complete trash. And I don't want to talk about L.A. cuisine like that, except for the Mexican, right? The Mexican hey, food is wonderful. Probably got some um, good tacos. <laughs> oh, man, it's this taco truck out, there, out here right now that's across the street from my house. And it is literally uh, stopping me from reaching each and every one of my weight goals that I've set for myself this year. So uh, I, I need you guys to definitely pray for me. Yeah. Uh, that I can uh, be released from this taco spirit out here in LA, but um, nothing can compare to Chicago cuisine, yeah. honestly. And uh, I think that I was spoiled with that. Even when I was living downtown uh, in Chicago, I lived right across the street from Giordano's, had beggars right there. It's just these Chicago delicacies that um, just became a normalcy for me. But when I got out here to LA, I'm thinking that it's supposed to be the same thing, but they're eating like avocado toast and, Smoothies uh, and <laughs> smoothies and just stuff with no seasoning and salt All stuff and like great the, the, for your goals for your fitness goals. Great for my goals, great for my goals, but it wasn't great for my soul. You know what I mean? So, uh, <laughs> and the crazy thing was that I, you know, you have people out here in LA. They've been out here in LA. They've been eating the the, the LA cuisine, and they would say, "Man, this is you got to try this restaurant. You got to try this restaurant. This is really really good." And I would get get my hopes up, and I'm all excited, and I would go there, and I would taste it, and I'm like. No, no, <laughs> no, this is not good. All right. So, I wouldn't want to be a rude, but uh, yeah, no, nah, the, the L.A. cuisine definitely wasn't cutting. No. So that's what we'll do. If ever I visit L.A., I'll hit you up. And then yeah. we'll, our goal will be to find the best food spots in L.A. <laughs> you know what? They're out here. You just got to find them. It's, it's taking me about two, two oh, or three I years. Oh, I can find them. find them. But I find them. Oh, you can find them? Oh, I can find them. You can them. find them? I can okay. find All I right, can find well, good food anywhere. I really can. <laughs> this is a, I'll leave it up to you. It's my spiritual gift. 
<laughs> um, <laughs> well, that's all right. We need to connect on that. So, so you're liking the move. You feel great in the in the organization that you're with. What are you doing yeah. as assistant vice president of financial services? Yeah, as assistant vice president, uh, so not a financial services, but uh, as of right now, I'm heading up our North American uh, OTC onboarding team. We're working with uh, OTC clients or so North American clients within the OTC space. And the OTC space is short for basically over-the-counter derivatives, uh, financial products that they're trading. It needs to be anything from credit default swaps to interest rate swaps to um, CFD equities and total return swaps and a whole bunch of other financial jargon that if you're not in the financial industry, you could care less about. But at the end of the day, I am sort of heading up the efforts on our team to facilitate the technical process. I'm a business analyst, so I'm going to facilitating the technical process of allowing them to basically hook up and send their files and their information into our system uh, to enable them to take advantage of the back office administration, administrative and accounting services that they're offering. So they're sort of like a little mix between finance and, and technical mm -hmm. work. And so uh, I'm on a team right now that we're doing that. And uh, so that's what I've been doing for the past three years at State Street. That sounds important. <laughs> sounds yeah, extremely okay. important. <laughs> so it, how did you, were okay. you always interested in this? Did, did, was this your pathway? How did, I know you said um, you went to Illinois Technical. Yeah, I went to the, yeah, you know what? I went to the Illinois Institute of Technology. And honestly, I was always into, I think I was more passionate about marketing. First, I wasn't passionate about anything. I was passionate about basketball. And then uh, that's what I remember um, you as just basketball. Yeah. Yeah. Basketball and anything education wise. I I was always smart. I was always intelligent. I was always able to get things done. And I think that I relied on that, but I just didn't necessarily always have the, the, the passion for education or the, the vision of where the education was actually going to take me or where I was going to use my education. I was more considering myself a basketball player and I, I was OK, but um, I had a uh, professor at the Illinois Institute of Technology. I'll never forget her. Her name was Miss Durango Cohen, Professor Durango Cohen. And uh, I was taking her business operations class and I, I, I was there and uh, I was just not focused. And I think I had failed her final miserably. It was probably embarrassing. Like you could just tell that I just was not there. I didn't care. I wasn't putting up any effort. I got an F on her final. And she only gives out two, two grades in her class. And so uh, I failed this midterm so bad I was probably going to have to get an A on her final in order to even just get a C or whatnot. And so she pulls me into her class and she says, uh, hey, Jeremy, what do you want to do with your life? You know, and, uh, you know, I respond to her and I tell her, you know, I want to play basketball. And I think by this time I had probably let go of my dreams to get to the NBA, but I was still holding on to being able to play professionally overseas or something like that. And she's like, what's your team's record? And I think at the time <laughs> the, rec the record was like three and 15 or something like that. I may have been averaging about like 20 some points at the time, but the record was pretty bad. And I think she said, she said, Jeremy, you're, you're on a team full of engineers because the Illinois Institute of Technology at the time, it wasn't known for basketball. And I honestly wasn't, I was there for basketball, but education is, is, is what is truly prominent at IIT. And she said, you know, you, you got to get serious about what you're doing. I said, you know what? You're right. And she just told me that she saw a lot of potential in me and, 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 and she saw something in me that I probably just didn't, not necessarily that I didn't see in myself at the time, but that I wasn't necessarily exhibiting. I think she even invited me to her house for Thanksgiving. Uh, Did you went go? Over to her house for thanks yeah, I went over to her house for Thanksgiving. It was, you know, it was the first time a teacher had really, you know, in college had reached herself, had extended herself to me like that. And so I ended up just going over to my professor's house for Thanksgiving, met her and her family. She fixed and prepared a lovely dinner went home and then, you know, after she kind of, you know, when you eat with somebody, you feel bonded with them. Yeah. And uh, the know that she had extended herself to me like that. I said, wow. I said, you know what? I'm not going to let her down. That final, I remember just staying up and studying for it and just studying and studying. It was an open book final. And I remember there was a friend I had, his name is Andre Pop, I believe, and he lived in Bridgeport at the time. Now, Bridgeport is a place in Chicago that is not very diverse and as a black person you just really don't want to be in bridgeport it's we chicago is a very segregated city mm -hmm. uh, and and uh you know you still have those particular areas where you know if you're you a black know, person you, you stay in this area. Yeah. yeah it's like i can go over there but if i go over there i'm going to have my head on a swivel i'm going to be watching out because people are going to be so surprised that i'm over there they're automatically going to be suspicious british pride of port is one of those towns and uh, or, or places within Chicago, should I say. And so uh, I was over there and I wanted to so bad. I remember walking back from there at like 
three o'clock at night, three o'clock in the morning, you know, from studying over there with him. I was a study partner and, and we were creating our little cheat sheets and whatnot and just reviewing notes. And I remember just walking back at three o'clock in the morning to my dorm, which was on State Street at the time. And I just remember saying to myself, like, man, I am crazy for even, I can't even believe I'm over here doing this and walking in this, but I, I guess I, I just really wanted it. So uh, I take the test and I thought I did pretty well, but I didn't know. But a couple of days later, uh, she calls me back and she's so ecstatic on the phone. She says, Jeremy, um, you got the highest grade in the class on the final and I'm passing you with a B. Congratulations. And so I think that year I ended up getting all B's in all of my classes. I, I, having the first half of the year, where I wasn't even paying attention. And so that's when I uh, started really, really, really focusing on uh, education. And I had ended up landing an internship that well, that year as well. So that's where it all kicked off for me. That was a turning point. Shout out to that professor. Yeah, yeah. Professor Durango Cohen. Yeah. Yeah, isn't it amazing? For sure. yeah. yeah. Isn't it amazing yeah. the impact that just one person can make? Change the whole trajectory, <clears throat> right? Just yeah, a little person, bit of effort. Person. You know what it is? It's, a, it's an honest truth, though. You know, if somebody has to truly care about you to be brutally honest with you, right? And to not necessarily care about hurting your feelings or whatnot. So when she told me, when she squashed my hoop dreams, she could have told me like, hey, you know, yeah, that could have went a couple of ways. You know, I could have rebelled against that or rejected that or used that as this like sort of Kobe Bryant story to say, hey, I'm going to show you. Yeah. But uh, when I looked at it, you know, and I was like, you know what, it's right. And, you know, and at the end of the day, even if I did still want to pursue basketball, greatness has no limits. And you don't you don't necessarily, if you're great in one area, you have to exhibit that greatness in another area. So it's about just challenge yourself, challenging yourself and putting that best foot forward no matter what you're doing. And I said I owed it to myself and I owed it to her. Definitely, definitely put my best foot forward in that class. And it's funny because she was teaching operations management. And that's the area that I ended up landing and getting my job in at CME Group and sort of being able to, you know, understand operations of a company has sort of got me where I am today. So um, think, it all came around full circle. Full circle. And I think full a big circle. part of that is, and I hope you give yourself some credit for this too, and you recognize that you showed up. She extended yeah. the invite, but you showed yeah. up and that's yeah, like half yeah. the battle. Like every single day we have a choice of whether or not we want to show up. And I think that's Definitely. important, right? Like you made yeah, the decision yeah, yeah. One to go. I'm going to Bridgeport. Exactly. I should, you know, I might be crazy, exactly. but I'm going to do it. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, I'm a big believer in God and, uh, you know, when it, when it comes to that particular aspect of my life, I feel like, you know, a lot of times it's really about just me just coming to the battlefield. And if I just come to the battlefield, um, everything else will get solved. You know, I may not even be the one that's necessarily doing the fighting. I, it's just my job to have faith enough to go to the battlefield. And so uh, that's what I, that's the approach that I just try to take in life. No matter what I'm doing, I just try to show up to the battlefield. I remember in, in college, you weren't really like a person, oh, I mean, I think you were a person of faith, but I don't remember like hearing you ever like talk about Don't tell me too much now, Andrew. Don't over, do, I think I was- well, Don't divulge right. too much. <laughs> but you don't divulge too much now. <laughs> I feel like you had an, I don't want to say extreme conversion, but like a yeah. an obvious conversion, like a noticeable yeah. shift. What made that yeah. for you? What was that, that about? You know, this is just about growing. This is just about growing. And uh, like I said, I've always, you know, uh, been a person of faith, should I say, may not have always exhibited that faith. And even sometimes now, I wouldn't necessarily consider myself to be the, a spokesperson for, you know, Christianity. But um, I was raised in the church. Uh, my mother was a very pivotal part of my life, making sure that I understood who God was in my life and, and sort of teaching me uh, that certain level of spirituality. And so the turning point for me was actually at IIT. I had transferred to a whole bunch of schools and I ended up at IIT. And uh, I was sort of isolated. You know, I was isolated from my friends. I was isolated from a lot of external influences. There was a Bible study group there that I went there. And actually, no, it was my friend. It was my friend, Vernell Robinson. Uh, shout out to Vernell Robinson. Uh, he played basketball with me one day. And uh, one time he just sort of challenged me on something uh, in regards to my Christian faith. He said, hey, you know, um, what do you think about this? And at first, you know, I, I sort of took the regular approach, like, you know, don't judge me, you know, I'm doing what I'm doing, but whatever, you know, God understands me, God knows my heart. And uh, I kind of sat back and then I, um, I thought about what he said later on that night. And I was like, you know what, he's right. He invited me to a Bible study at Illinois Institute of Technology. And I, and, and I went there and, uh, and just sort of seeing him, you know, model a certain level of behavior, it, it gave me something to sort of look at as a template. 
And I think that's where it really started for me and just sort of just maturing as you mature and you go through life and you go through various experiences and you, you, you get in classes and you, you got an F and you don't know how you're going to get a B, but you're praying that you're going to get a B and somehow, some way you get a B and you start saying, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. And it's like, wait a minute. Then there comes a point in time when it says, okay, now. All right, maybe I got to start doing something with a guy here. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so I think honestly, my experience at IIT is what sort of kick started that for me. And honestly, it's just sort of been a proponent for me. And uh, me being in situations many times in my life where the odds are stacked against me, that's my foundation. That's what I lean on. And uh, that's literally what has carried me through um, from being where I was to being where I am today. And so that's where it was. That's what's happened for me. But it, it was always there. It was always there. What about your upbringing? Where did you start? I know your dad was a judge, but I don't yeah. remember like what your background in history was like. Yeah, so so my father wasn't always a judge. I think he became a judge. I can't necessarily remember the year, but he became a judge. I think when I was in high school or when I first uh, started high school, uh, so it was later on, but I knew he was a lawyer. He didn't live with me. So I, you know, I always knew who my father was, always knew where he was. We had a relationship, but he did not live with me. Um, so I'm a product of a single parent household. It was my mother and my father lived in River Forest. I was born in Lake Meadows on 33rd and King Drive in the 500 building there. I, I remember it. It was 807. I think when I was five years old, I remember I was always telling my mother, like, man, I want my own bedroom. I want my own bedroom. And I remember we moved over to Wood Lake Townhomes on 46 and Woodlawn. Uh, and I finally got my one bedroom. So that was a townhome. And now that's where I spent the majority of my childhood on 46 and Woodlawn. So it's the South side, uh, even more specifically, it's an area called the low end. Yeah, so 46 and Woodlawn is where I grew up. Um, it was sort of right in the middle and I think a lot of gentrification actually, not in the middle, but in the beginning okay. where, gentr where gentrification really took place. And so these were buildings that were abandoned right next to 47th street. And as a child, I think the townhomes that we were in, we were literally the first new development that was over there. And uh, I slowly but surely saw abandoned buildings become buildings that were worth four and five hundred six hundred thousand dollars and even now millions of dollars in that particular area I saw schools become go from abandoned to being some of one of the best schools in the city and did you get to benefit from that i don't know if i got the benefit from that because i didn't go to those schools uh, my mother didn't let me go to any neighborhood schools uh she knew that i would get in trouble she didn't want me to get in trouble or be around anybody that i lived around I was just a very active kid. I was a very curious kid. I had a big personality. And so she kind of wanted to maintain that. And so I was able to fortunately test into uh, uh, Skinner School, which is a, a gifted school out there. It was across the street from Whitney Young, which is a very prominent school in Chicago. Mm -hmm. It's not as good as Morgan Park, but it's an okay school. But you went to Morgan <laughs> and, Park, uh, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> shout out to my Morgan. Shout out to my Morgan Park Mustangs out there. So uh, yeah, I went to Skinner School. And actually somebody who went to Skinner School, Chance, the rapper went to Skinny School. Skinny oh, school yeah? Right yeah, there, there's a few people we got that went to Skinner School right now. There, there's a kid right now. He's uh, He'll probably end up being in the NBA. His name is Amari Bailey. He plays on that team with LeBron's son in CRK, and he went to Skinner School. Uh, there's a couple of people that went to Skinner School, but I, I joke around and say, like, I, I kicked off that trend. Yeah, so uh, that, that was sort of the uh, foundation of my upbringing. That sort of, you know, that was really what developed my mind. That was really what shaped my mind. Uh, was around a very uh, diverse community of, of children or a first student body of children. I remember we were learning sign language, Spanish. We would sing songs in Hebrew, uh, sing songs in Spanish, uh, singing songs and performing them in sign language. So uh, I went to school with, with Asian, Indian, Jews, Blacks, Whites, and, and I was getting the top tier level education at that. So I was definitely privileged, honored, and uh, blessed to receive that level of education, guided by, uh, I think, was the principal at that time. Started off Principal Billups, Dr. Billups. Shout out to Dr. Billups. I, I knew my principals very well when I was in school. We, we spent <laughs> some time together. So we Grand had some bunches. very intimate sessions. <laughs> yeah, we had some intimate sessions, and uh, Dr. Billups, and then later on, Principal Clark. There were definitely some big influences on my life, as well as some great, very dynamic teachers there. They definitely played a pivotal role in my development education. Mm -hmm. And then that landed yeah. you to basketball at Morgan Park. And yeah. then that was yeah, recruiting always, what to North Central. Is that how it played yeah. out? Yeah, Skinner School only goes up to the sixth grade. And uh, so usually it's that time you're either going to go to another one of the gifted programs. Our school didn't even have a basketball team. Like 
we didn't play, we played basketball there, but they didn't care about competing in basketball. Like they cared about competing academically. I can literally remember our teachers picking up the newspapers and reading uh, the IGAP scores or the Iowa test scores or some of the other standardized tests that we would take. And they would be reading those test scores and saying like, okay, you know, this particular school did this well, we need to make sure that we do this. And that's what was, what was drilled into us on a daily basis. And so the emphasis was definitely put on academics there. Mm-hmm. And so um, to make a long story short, you're sort of just, you're sort of bred to go to the Whitney Young School right after there. It's right across the street from Whitney Young. So you, you after it's sixth like grade, you're going school. to the feeder school, yeah, to a seventh and eighth grade program. And it's either Whitney Young, Kenwood High School, which is a very good high school, by the way, and also Morgan Park. And so um, I didn't get into Whitney Young, unfortunately, but fortunately. So my next two options that I actually got into were Kenwood and Morgan Park. Kenwood was uh, the, my, my neighborhood high school, so I was going to get into there regardless. But my mother didn't want me to go there because, once again, she didn't want me to go in school around my friends. I think I resented her for it at the time, but as I get older, um, I'm thankful. I, I think it was a very wise decision that she made, and I think it, it, it helped a system of checks and balances on me uh, as I was growing up. And so I ended up going to Morgan Park. And uh, I wasn't recruited there to play basketball, but I ended up playing basketball and, you know, ended up doing pretty well there and uh, ended up getting recruited to play basketball at North Central College where we met. And uh, I think after North Central College, I ended up transferring to a couple of different schools and uh, ended up at IIT. When I ended mm-hmm. up at IIT, I knew it was a very prominent school academically yeah. and it had a reputation that exceeded itself in the business world as well. And so uh, I said, you know what, I'm going to stick it out here. I did my time there and I graduated with my degree in finance there. What do you take with you when you think about that illustrious background? And I I mean that um, in the best, like, like seriously, you kind of had the best of both worlds. I did. I was blessed, you know, to grow up where I grew up. I grew up on the middle of 47th Street. So I was exposed to certain things, but my mother was wise enough to shield me from certain things. So while I was exposed to certain things, I necessarily wasn't participating in certain things. And so, you know, I was able I was able to sort of develop a certain level of toughness about myself. I was able to sort of develop the level of of competing. You know, Some of my friends that I was raised around, you know, they helped sharpen me. You know, I had the best of both worlds. It's like I would be going to Skinner School in the daytime, competing with some of the best minds academically in the city, but coming home and slap boxing and racing and, 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 and playing basketball with some of the best people in the neighborhood locally. So yeah. um, I definitely kind of got the best of both worlds and, and it really just sharpened me and, and it gave me a, a level of versatility that today I see a lot of people just don't have because they, they may not have been able to experience those but the best of both worlds. And so once again, I had to get a kudos to my mother um, who was just wise enough to be able to understand situations and understand environments and knew the environments to protect me from, but also simultaneously knew the environments to place me in. Yeah. But shout out to your mom. Yeah. Shout out to my mom. As I get older and and, and I, and I find out more and more how the world works and, and how, you know, raising children, even though I don't have kids, I just see the marvelous job that she did and the decisions that she made and to know that she was doing it as a single parent is just, is just amazing. And so I'm thankful to God for her. Okay. So let's talk and, and get into this discussion on uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion in corporate America yeah. and yeah. the effects of systemic racism as it relates to yeah. African-American employees. Uh, yeah. What's your perspective? It's something that I'm passionate about. Uh, it's yeah. something that I find myself discussing a lot, uh, especially nowadays. Uh, and it's something that I feel obligated that, you know, me being in a position, you know, once again, that 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 just the position of walking in both worlds. I'm definitely a black man in America, but at the end of the day, you know, I'm, I'm operating in predominantly white environments within the financial services. I, I want to do the best that I possibly can to speak up and not only be a certain level of tangible representation, but also speak up and do what I can to fight to make these spaces uh, better for those persons that are coming in after me. And so uh, it's funny you say that because a lot of times, I think um, when I was younger in third grade, uh, we had a project in school where we had to sort of draw our faces on a paper plate. And uh, the teacher gave us occupations that we would have. And so she said, okay, this person's going to be a doctor. This one's going to be a lawyer. And her name is Miss Patterson, by the way, third grade teacher. Um, the occupation that she gave me was to be an ambassador for Africa. So I think even back then, I was always 
you know, one to kind of just raise my hand and, and speak up and, and talk about these certain issues and talk about things that were going on. Even back then, I think that there was a particular group in the uh, community of Zambas, uh, the name of the group was called Taifa. And it was just a community organization group. And I remember they would come and just scoop us up as kids and uh, they would sit us down and they would talk about African-American history. And they would just impart to us uh, just a certain level of pride in who we were as a people and the history of our people and talk about you know our ancestry and just uh, African-American inventors. That was the first time that they had given us a list of African-American inventors. And we had to end up, we had to study that list and play a game the next day and being able to name African-Americans and what they invented. Mm-hmm. Of course, I ended up winning. My team ended up winning that game. But I just walked away just knowing, just looking at all of the things that African-Americans had invented. And I was just like, wow. Uh, and once again, I noticed the contradiction uh, in juxtaposition to what I was learning in the history books about, you know, slavery and, you know, that that limited perspective there at school. Mm-hmm. Right. But then coming home and, and actually in the community, you know, getting it straight from someone that was also African-American that had studied these things extensively and understanding like, wow, you know, our history just didn't start with slavery. And that even in spite of slavery, African-Americans had really done some very significant things uh, that contributed to advancing the country uh, forward and helping the country to establish itself as a superpower within the world, even though we necessarily didn't always get the credit for it. You know, that was that was where it's all sort of started to me. And so stemming the day, you know, that's my foundation. And so stemming the day, coming into uh, working in the financial services in, industry and being many times the, the only black on a team or the only black on the floor and just recognizing some of the disparities um, that exist for African-Americans within the workspace and, and knowing the uh, complications that come with that and uh, the disparities, the various things that, that African-Americans have to overcome just to you know, be able to be successful in these spaces. I noticed them and uh, while overcoming many of them, these things myself, but at the end of the day, I still want to be passionate about using my voice and my position to speak up about these things anywhere that I can, not just for myself, but most importantly for those persons that are coming in after me. And uh, honestly, just advocating for African-Americans and, and our skill sets and uh, sort of just doing what I can to remove these conscious and unconscious biases that have been placed on the African-American community. And that sort of linger on as some of the effects of systemic racism. Like you said, sometimes the only black person <clears throat> on the floor, in the room, in your yeah, position. Yeah. What are some yeah. of those unique challenges that you face and what are some of those obstacles that prevent others from reaching higher levels of success or higher heights um, to where it's not just one now, it's two or three or there's more? Yeah. You know what? Um, some of the challenges that you face as an African-American working in these predominantly white spaces uh, that sometimes you're you're working with people that may not necessarily uh, have even been around African-Americans. Right. And what they know about African-Americans is what they've seen on TV. And a lot of those images uh, that you see on TV and the mainstream media, they just aren't pleasant images. And so um, if you have somebody that that but those images are influential. Right. And so if you have somebody with those particular images in their head or just what they've seen or what they heard, not necessarily what they experienced, that's where a lot of these uh, biases come from. Right. You can have various biases that African-Americans aren't as smart, you know, or not as technical as other people or they're not able to lead or uh, not all the way as honest or they're looking for the easy way out all the time or just, you know, those can be certain things. So sometimes you have to battle some of those biases. Right. Also, you know, sometimes you you can be literally dealing with somebody that can be racist, right? That's mm-hmm. <laughs> I think yeah. that's a hard truth that we have to accept, and we never want to act like that's a possibility. But no one ever it, wants right? to admit and, that, right? Like, oh, yeah, yeah, nobody ever wants to admit it. But we've seen it, right? We look at and we see it now with the development of social media now, and just the development of technology and iPhones now, and just how we have access to information now. So you have some of these instances where you see people acting less than ideal and acting in racist manners, and you looked up and uh, you see that they're professors at colleges, they're managers in your institutions, they're owners of companies. And you say, wait a minute, if this person acts like this outside of the job, how are they gonna work inside of the workplace where they have even more control and they have you know, a, a particular say-so with someone's fate? And so you can be working with situations like that. And uh, you may not never know because it's not like somebody's walking up to you and calling the, calling you the N-word in front of your face. Like those mm-hmm. days are over with. 
Yeah. But you can just look at the numbers, right? When you look at the numbers, you see a lack of representation, not only within the employee base, but also within leadership, right? And definitely within management, see that lack of re representation. And that lack of re representation will give you the perception that there's a glass ceiling, right? And when you see, when you think that there's a glass ceiling, that's going to sort of affect your, your, your incentive. It's going to affect your belief that you have that, you know, it's going to affect your or willingness to work hard and achieve what you want to achieve. Not saying that it, it, it has to, but for some people, for the average person, if they say, hey, why am I going to come and give my all to this company when no matter what I do, I'm probably not going to, you know, break through the ranks, right? And uh, be able to get promoted, you know, because, you know, of my skin color or whatnot, or because of my race, or because of some level of bias that exists within the company. And you say, well, it's not possible, or that's not necessarily the case. But when you look around and you don't see any, you know, black leaders, you don't see any black managers, you don't see any black CEOs, you say, well, you know, maybe that is the case. In organizations, if there isn't a lot of representation, is yeah. it because the, there's a glass ceiling or it, could it yeah. also be that if you're in a predominantly white organization, you're you're going to naturally yeah. hire predominantly white exactly. people or who's in your social exactly. circle? Um, I know exactly. I know plenty of organizations who are saying no, there needs to be change. Well, now because of the the awareness, but um, yes. Yes. but I wouldn't classify. I guess I wouldn't classify them as a racist or or yeah. meaningful yeah. and trying to hinder. Yeah. It's more of a. I didn't think of it before. Now I don't want to say that's, that's a, the case for all, all, everybody because I don't right, think that's, right, that's right. truly the case for every situation. Yeah. But yeah. that's I guess a hard but one I'm, to grapple with. Yeah, no, it's not. It's not. You know what? It's not a hard one to grapple with. It's an excellent point. It's. It, it, you literally were segueing into the next point that I was going to make, and that you know I don't go into situations and look at organizations and say this person's racist, this person's racist, this person's racist, this person's racist, just because they're they're white and that they're they're not black. Because I don't necessarily think that that's always the case, and many times more than not, I don't think that's the case. But I think what happens is we always say this. We say it's not what you know, but it's who you know, right? And we always have these colloquialisms that we quote about networking and your network determines your network and we hold networking seminars and we hold you know talk about relationship building and the positive effects of relationship building and establishing relationships uh, within a particular industry because we know at the end of the day sometimes these relationships are what's going to be some significant factors in your progress and development within Ain't that uh, the truth? these corporations. And so you have to think about it because of systemic racism, because of Jim Crow, because of intentional segregation, you have these organizations that became predominantly white, right? And so you have these organizations that were not only predominantly white, but blacks were not even allowed in them. And so you have hiring managers, right? Hiring managers that are predominantly white. And so nowadays, you know, what it, it's it's only natural somebody's going to hire within their network, right? It's only natural that somebody's going to hire somebody that they feel comfortable com communicating with. Uh, sometimes it may not necessarily be racist, but it may be thinking like, you know, I don't know, maybe hiring this black person. I don't know. I may not want to get in trouble because they're going to think that I'm doing something racist. So they're going to think that. I'm getting on them or that I'm reprimanding them. I'm really just reprimanding them because they're doing, they're not doing the best job, but maybe if I reprimand this black person, I'm going to have to deal with racism or I'm going to have to deal with yeah. um, accusations of racism, or I'm going to have to have conversations about race. And that's not something that I'm used to doing. And that's not something that I'm comfortable with doing. So I'm going to automatically avoid that. That's not necessarily always racism, but that's rooted in systemic racism. And it's still a bias. And it's at the end of the day, it's these certain things that are keeping African Americans out of these particular positions within corporate America and just within working spaces. And at the end of the day, you know, these, you know, corporate America and these working spaces unlock wealth for mm -hmm. families, right? And th these have been the, the sources of generational wealth that has been built for families, right? And so there's something to be had there, right? And, you know, you have some people that have gained a foothold uh, within industries and, and, you know, gaining power. And, and gaining influence, uh, it's not so easy to let that go, you know, all the time. So um, like you said, it's not always necessarily because of direct racism, but you know, you have situations where working spaces have become predominantly white because of systemic racism and intentional segregation such as Jim Crow and just the legacy of that uh, stemming. So what's the solution, right? Is the solution, yeah. hey, we need more representation. Let's just get yeah. um, more people in the pipeline. Is that really yeah. the root cause? I mean, how do you 
go about fixing that? And that's a question I think that yeah. we're all trying to um, ask right now. What's your perspective on where do we want to take this? How, how can we improve? And, and in which ways do you see the most impact and like lasting change? Yeah, you know what? Um, that's a question that we're all asking, but um, I want to say that that's a question that we're all capable of answering too. It's a, it's a difficult question to answer. Damn, Jeremy. It's, 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 <laughs> we're, we're, we're capable of answering yeah. that question. And uh, this, this isn't necessarily an answer that eludes us. It's about fixing those things that were broken. And so there's going to be various approaches to that, right? Um, there's going to be uh, an educational approach where you're going to have to inform employees or have to inform organizations and leaders of organizations about systemic racism, right? And the effects of systemic racism and how that plays an advantage or creates privilege uh, for various persons of the dominant society today when it comes to uh, advancing within these particular organizational settings. Uh, so that's one thing that's going to have to take place. Secondly, you're going to have to have leaders of these organizations step up uh, and not only hold themselves accountable, uh, but hold their leaders within their organization accountable for having these difficult conversations, talking about these particular different things and uh, stepping into uncharted territory and to making the necessary changes in order to uh, make sure that we're truly uh, creating environments that are conducive to diversity, inclusion, but most important, equity, right? Because that's what it's about at the end of the day. It's equity, equality, and even justice, right? To make sure that we're, we're administering a certain level of justice here to make sure that we're giving everybody an even playing field. Thirdly, you're going to have to have people such as myself and people such as you and people that are within these organizations, you're going to have to speak up. We're going to have to speak up and we're going to have to not be afraid to bring up these tough conversations and uh, to understand that that the fight is not necessarily over. Um, I think when I think about my, my our parents' generations and we think about the 50s and 60s and even Martin Luther King, we saw them where racism was a little bit more blatant and we saw that, you know, they, they were fighting for equal rights, they were fighting for civil rights. We saw, you know, the benefits from that, right? We're the generation that really benefited from that. And uh, so we were able to go into these corporate spaces, even though many of us, maybe not a lot of us were able to go into these corporate spaces. Some of us were able to get into these corporate spaces because of the policies that were created that our parents' generation were fighting for. So uh, definitely want to salute to them for that. And we've gotten comfortable, right? But mm -hmm. the thing is, we can't get that comfortable. We have to understand that the battle is not necessarily yet won. And that while uh, we have been included, the playing field has not necessarily been made uh, equal. This is something that we're going to have to be brave enough to say that, uh, you know, we're going to have to be willing to make some sacrifices on our own, right? And we're going to have to step up. One of my favorite people in history is Harriet Tubman, uh, probably the most favorite person in history for me. And the thing about it, that, that about her that just amazes me the most is that um, she was not just a person that was brave enough to acquire freedom for just herself, right? But after she went through what she went through, we, we just talk about the Underground Railroad, like it was just an easy feat and you just hid in boxes and traveled at night. But I think about the journey sometimes and I think about like, man, you know, what was it if you caught a cold, right? What was it if you caught the flu and got sick? What was it about like if you were hiding and the slave catchers were coming alongside and you had to not sneeze or you had to not make a sound or you had a baby with you and you just had to pray to God that that baby didn't cry. What happened if you were running in the field or you're running through these woods or these swamps and you sprain an ankle or you you break a finger or you somebody tweaked their knee or somebody was older and they just had to keep going. And just think about, you know, the, the, the what that took to just sort of literally travel on foot. <laughs> from one part of the country, a southern part of the country to the northern part of the country. I, I probably wouldn't even drive that, let alone travel on foot. And after she made it for herself, she didn't just sit there and just bask in her glory and say, all right, cool. Thank God I made it through that and go on and live her life. Like, no, she went back. She went she back. She went back. She went back. And not only did she go back, but she went back time and time and time and time and time again until she no longer could go back. And so I look at that as somebody for myself, right? You know, I understand that I was given various privileges as a young person and with my mother and my upbringing and the things that she was able to expose me to as a youth. And that may have given me advantage, even with growing up amongst, you know, my other black colleagues and things of that particular nature. And I may have been able to break into this particular space, but at the end of the day, am I just going to break into this particular space and, and try my best to live comfortably and progress on my own and say, hey, look what I was able to do. You can do it too. 
or am I going to go back and continue to fight or do what I can to play my part in making sure that these spaces are made accessible to other people that I know that are just as talented as me and even more talented than me, but haven't been necessarily been given the access because of the color of their skin or because of biases associated with their race and so on. Um, my choice is to go back. And so other people have to make that choice to go back. Even though you've done good, go back. I think lastly, I think we touched on it when we talked about hiring managers. Um, you know, when I think about an organization, I think of about it as a body, right? And, you know, I play sports and so I understand, you know, the importance of the core, right? Your core is where your power comes from. Your core is the most uh, important part of your body when you're talking about movement, when you're talking about progression. I liken that into an organization. And I think um, there's, we've had top, we, a lot of times we've had bottom up approaches, right? When we're saying that, you know, people that are working within the organization, they have to speak up and, and make these problems known and do their, their best to change the culture by voicing their opinion and voicing uh, what's going on and, and demanding change. And we, we sort of progress to a point now where you're seeing a top-down approach, right? Where you're seeing that leaders of organizations are coming out and they're having to speak out against these things. And, you know, we don't know whether or not they're doing it all the time because they want to do it or if there's a certain level of social and political pressure right. to is do it, it as well. But, is it just yeah, the, the flavor yeah, of the yeah. day? Is this really yeah, uh, yeah. something that you're putting money into? But the real change, the real change is going to happen um, once you have that infusion of equality, that infusion of diversity, inclusion, and equity within the core of the organization. And what I call the core of the organization, that's what I call your middle management. And those are your are your hiring managers, right? Um, you have hiring managers that are pretty much gatekeepers of your organization, right? Gatekeepers of your company. They're gonna hire people into the organization. Also, they're managing these teams and they're controlling who's getting promoted and who's not getting promoted. So if you don't have diversity or representation within the core of organizations, within these hiring managers positions, within middle management, you know, you're gonna to continue to find yourself having to go back and do it again after unfortunately another tragedy happens uh where you know you you a certain level of racism is evident on tv and you're forced to look at your numbers and a company and you say hey why don't we have blacks in these positions why don't we have latinx in these positions why don't we, why are we just why why are we still predominantly white in these spaces well it's because the core of your organization is predominantly white and you need to diversify that particular space uh in order to make sure that um, you have a diverse representation amongst decision makers within the organization. So those are some things in short that I think necessarily needs to take place. And also there's a governmental police, affirmative action played a great tool, even though uh, we didn't end up necessarily benefiting from affirmative action in the way that we wanted to or probably thought that we were going to as African-Americans, pushing for policy change in Washington, DC is definitely um, something that needs to take place in order to enforce this, right? Because right here where people are going to work, that's where, when you go to work, that's where you're going to probably experience, you know, racism, right? When I was growing up on the South side of Chicago, we were pretty segregated. So I'm going to be honest, I probably didn't experience too much racism because I wasn't even interacting with whites on a, on, on a daily basis. But when I go into these particular working spaces, that's when I'm going to be forced to interact with the dominant society on a regular basis and they're going to be forced to interact with me and not only that but more than likely there's going to be a white person if i'm working in the bank there's going to be a white person that has some level of say so of how much money i make yeah. <laughs> you know the rate at which i'm promoted you know how far within an organization that i'm going to go and so that's that those are the things you know that's that's where the money is right mm -hmm. and so that's where you know, somebody's going to really establish, you know, or really deal with racism. And honestly, if I was riding on a train and a white person came and, 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 and or any person came and they called me the N word, I'm going to be, I probably wouldn't even care. It, it doesn't change the, you know, I would care, but at the end of the day, you haven't taken any money from me. You haven't put me in any type of danger. You haven't affected my life in any way, shape, form, or fashion. You know, if I feel like, you know, addressing you, I will. But honestly, if I just look at you as a clown, then I could just probably look at you as a clown and keep going about my day and, and continue what I was doing and never, ever, ever think of you again. But if I'm experiencing racism on the job, right, and I have somebody uh, that's controlling my fate, that's controlling, you know, whether or not you get promoted, 
Yeah, if you're where still, I live, whether or yeah. not my kids can go to a private school. If I go on vacations with my wife, proverbially, because I'm, I'm single and I don't have kids, but I'm speaking for everybody here, right? Um, that's what I care about. And that's that's the real racism there, not because somebody called me an N-word or, you know, things of that particular nature. That's that's a, that's that's a sign of racism as well, but that's not the racism that affects us. I, I love that you make that point because this is where I, I would say most professionals that's where you're going to experience it is that work right yeah. like yeah, it's real yeah. it happens every day yeah. and what i guess <clears throat> the question the follow-up question to that is how do you compensate for that you know, i've been in situations where the odds are stacked against me uh sometimes when, when the odds are stacked against me my foundation comes within my faith in god right and that's what literally gives me the confidence that i can be successful within these you know, situations where the odds may look like they're stacked against me or the numbers are not necessarily in my favor, right? And so that's my foundation, just having a faith in God and, and just being basically believing on the impossible to become possible. Um, that's my foundation. And uh, all of those things you mentioned are one of those things, right? It's about understanding organizations and understanding culture, right? Understanding the culture of organizations. And when you're picking and choosing where you wanna work for, looking at those organizations and seeing, okay, what are their feelings about diversity? How do they feel about diversity and inclusion and equity and specifically anti-racism? Uh, what is the leadership doing to combat these particular things? Um, how diverse is the management there? A lot of times when I think that people are being interviewed, you know, when I give uh, advice to other people that are going on interviews, I tell them, <clears throat> interview the interviewer, you know, because it's a two-sided thing here. It's like, you don't just want to come into a company where you don't, you, you know, you don't have, they, you give, you're giving them all the visibility into you, but they don't, you don't necessarily have any visibility into what they're doing. So you have to ask these particular questions and find out what they're doing. And you have to understand your fit. It's not just about getting a, a job that matches your skill set per se, because you can be in a job that matches your skill set, but the culture of that organization does not necessarily match what you want to acquiesce to or what you're willing to acquiesce to culturally within an organization. And so these are questions that you need to ask in regards to just researching on an organization. Um, also finding allies uh, and networking. I hate the fact that you have to do this, but sometimes I say like, you know, sometimes you have to work a little bit harder, you know, not even as an African-American, but as a minority, no matter what you are, right? If you're not a uh, part of that dominant populace within any particular space that you are, you're going to have to work a little harder as far as networking, right? And you're going to have to find people that are willing to help you. I've been blessed to find people that are willing to help me, um, that look like me and some of those people that don't look like me. There are white people and have been white people that have played pivotal parts in the advancement and the progression of my career. And so uh, just being willing to, you know, look at those odds that are against you and say, you know what, I know that these, you know, I know that it looks like this is a daunting situation, but I'm not going to let that affect me. And I'm just going to still go full throttle forward. I'm going to still try to progress and I'm still going to try to do those things to put myself uh, in positions to succeed in whatever that I'm doing. And I'm still just necessary. I'm going to outwork the competition. And so you have to have that attitude. You have to have that mindset. You have to be determined. Uh, you have to be sort of passionate about that. And at the end of the day, nothing's going to substitute for being good at what you're doing and making sure you're on top of your game, uh, making sure you're on point. You know, I remember I read a book that said good is not good enough. Uh, and it's a book that's about, you know, being a minority uh, within the working space and saying that being good is not good enough. You know, I don't like to maybe I'm just rebelling against that because I hate that. Right. But sometimes it is true. But I just think it talks about just being willing to go above and beyond. And I think no matter what you're doing, you know, just continue to go above and beyond, continue to challenge yourself, continue to stretch yourself, continue to just be a good person. And uh, I think that if you continue to do those things, you're going to experience some level of success. You're going to be able to progress. Mm -hmm. You mentioned um, how there were people who look like you who've been pivotal and then people who don't look like you. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I know me growing up as a minority, and in predominantly white schools, predominantly white working environments, it's yeah. really hard for me to not see color. It is almost yeah. like I, I always notice it. And it's almost where I have to like question myself, like, am I being right. biased? Am I be am I looking at this person only for the color of their skin versus right. they're embracing right. me? They're my friend. They don't exactly but maybe they see color too, but maybe they they look past it. Like exactly. sometimes I feel like in certain yeah. situations, I've brought that. Yeah. I, I even noticed it with my son uh, with 
um, the police uh, situation right now. You know, right now there's yeah. LM and then there's back the blue or, or it, it's, it's almost right. like we have to remind ourselves it's not white versus black. It's not good versus bad. It's 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 us against apathy. It's us against yeah. ignorance. It's us against laziness. It's us against um, thinking that we're past this. So I think having exactly. and being vigilant on on who we are and checking ourselves and where we stand and also willing to be that voice, I think is important. But um, sometimes I felt like there were certain situations where um, perhaps I didn't ask for the raise or I didn't go for the job, yeah. not because they wouldn't accept me, but because I just didn't yeah. think I could. Yes. Yeah. You know what? And that's, that's definitely bias takes takes place on both sides. Right. Um, you can be biased against other people. Right. Um, you can be consciously biased against a white person by assuming that they're racist. Right. When they're really not racist. And that can stop you from attempting to network with them or attempting to establish a relationship with them because you're coming in with the preconceived notion that they're they're racist. And so that, that that's not necessarily always a correct attitude to have. And at the end of the day, you can be biased against yourself and say that, you know, uh, maybe they don't want me or maybe, you know, these are these are particular things that are going to affect me as an African-American or as a minority within a predominantly white working space. And I have to continue and continuously and daily remind myself of these things that I'm not motivated by fear and I try not to be influenced by fear. Fear is an illusion. I, I'll, I'll take that from the, the great Michael Jordan. Uh, it was a book that my mother actually bought me. It was the first book from Michael Jordan that I read. Everybody was getting this book called Rare Air. I didn't get that, but my mother bought me a book about Michael Jordan. It was called Fear is an Illusion. I don't even think people have noted that he wrote that book, but uh, it may not, be not, may not be one of his most popular books, but it's definitely a book that changed my life. And when you think about fear, right? Fear is you you're, you're created a situation in your mind that doesn't exist and you're reacting to it. And so a lot of times as African-Americans or minorities within these particular situations, we think about what we've experienced, right? And our fears can be shaped by past experiences and past traumas, right? But at the end of the day, while that fear may be valid in how it was caused, yeah. right? It's not valid that we keep it there, right? Fear is always invalid. So yeah. I think we have to be just continuously fearless within these situations. And I think I've entered into a space uh, within my career and just within my life period, period where I'm just operating with a certain level of boldness, I'm trying to operate with a certain level of fearlessness. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to challenge my thing, myself to do things that I am afraid of. I'm afraid of going out and talking to this person or calling this person saying, you know, you know, as a matter of fact, <laughs> me getting involved with the diversity, the diversity movement at my current job that I'm at right now started with me literally sending a letter to the CEO of our company. Uh, the chief diversity officer of our company and the chief human resources officer of our company and telling them what I think that they needed to do or what I think we could do as an organization to advance the African-American experience within the working space and talking about, you know, the retention and hiring and, 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 and promotion of black employees and what we could do in order to make sure that we're operating way more effectively and efficiently within the space as it deals to uh, providing an equitable environment for uh, African-American employees and not just African-American employees, but, but employees of color as well, because we have an initiative on our company where we're focusing not just on black employees, but we're focusing on the, the disparities between the, with, with black and Latinx employees. And so, and also other employees of color, whether it's Asian or minorities or, Indian, or Indians, but we do have a focus specifically uh, and intentionally on black and Latinx employees. And so get back to the point or the, the point of the question, you know, I, I sat around and I thought about that for like a day. I was like, I was like, man, who do I think I am? Like uh, State Street is literally the, the ninth largest financial institution, not the company, I mean, not the country, but the world. Um, over 10% of the world's economy flows through State Street on a daily basis. Uh, we're a global company with over 40,000 employees. So our CEO is, uh, you know, this isn't necessarily, he's not the CEO of a mom and pop shop we're running. Right. Here. And no, dis no disrespect to, you know, CEOs of mom and pop shops. You know, I, I've seen the CEO on, on MSNBC and CNBC and on some very reputable stations. And, you know, he, he's an ex extremely influential decision maker. And so I, ha I had to sort of check myself and I said, hey, you know, am I messing up my career here? And are they going to think, who am I? 
or am I sort of am I, will I be blackballed because I speak up or whatever the situation is and I just say I'm tossing all fear aside like you know fear is not going to get me to where I want to be and uh you know if I go down I want to go down for believing in what I believe in if I you know and I was being bold I'd rather go down being bold than being afraid and so I ended up sending uh that email and that email has, has literally catapulted me to being involved uh, very significantly within the diversity, inclusion, and equity movements within our company, and has uh, sort of just given me a confidence that I have the ability, and not only the ability, but the obligation to speak up, not only within State Street, but just outside of that period. And so you, can, you can't operate in fear. Fear is just an illusion. Remember that. Fear is just an illusion, and, and operating yeah. in boldness. I love that. Yeah. Right? Yeah, fearlessness. Uh, yeah. And then the response was great. You're you're making change or affecting change where you are with what you have. Um, yeah. What does the next level look like for you? Um, I absolutely have no idea. Um, I, I have an idea, but okay. What do you um, want it to look like? Somewhere where I'm, where I'm really being influential and and uh, being in some particulars, being in particular spaces of influence where. Um, I can make things better for a lot of people, no matter what I'm doing. I think that's what I want to do, you know, whether that's, you know, being a leader in a particular organization. Sometimes I wrestle with whether or not I want to become involved in politics. I don't know about yet, that yet. You should. Um, You're great at speaking. You're great at speaking. I, I, I hear that all the time. But, uh, you know, honestly, politics is such a I would have to hear God tell me audibly himself. But um, I think as yeah. of right now, I just want to uh, continue to do the, the best job that I can do in the particular organizational space that I'm in. And uh, once I my head hits the ceiling there, I kind of I'll, I'll go into it from there. You know, honestly, I said something the other day. I posted a meme. I said, uh, I don't have a five year. You know, this is something that I posted uh, on Twitter uh, a while back, maybe like years ago. It could have been something that's like 10 years ago. But I remember it's funny how they bring up these memories. Yeah. But I said to myself, I said, I said, uh, I don't have a five year plan. I just try to listen to the Holy Spirit every day. And uh, I, I just have confidence that I'll be OK no matter what I'm doing. So it's worked um, out so far. It's worked out so far. And I think that's how I actually ended it. I said, and, and that's been working out so far. And so uh, th that's my plan. I, I really don't know. But uh, I know whatever I'm doing, a pivotal part of my life is always going to be reaching back and doing what I can to make the situation better for myself and others. You know, I care about people. I'm a big people person. I love connecting with people. I, I understand the, uh, the the sacrifices that are made for me and how people have extended their hands to help me. And uh, I, I really just want to be in a position where I can do that for somebody else. So whatever I'm doing, it, it's going to be involved in that, uh, involved around that in some way, shape, form, or fashion. Could you imagine what 18 years ago in Raw and we'd be here now talking, <laughs> you know what? No, wanting to no, change I the didn't. world? <laughs> you know, as I think about it, you've always been a very a very good conversationalist yourself. And uh, when I'm looking at your podcast and the way that you have things set up, um, very professional. And like you've always been articulate and you've always been able to speak. You've always been able to speak to a wide range of audiences. So I, I really see successful things taking off for you in, in this particular space, you know, as you continue to keep going and continue to stay consistent. And uh, I'm, I'm definitely impressed by everything you have going on. So uh, no, I, it's funny, I, you, you never would have thought we would have ended up like this, but when I look back at it now, it doesn't surprise me at all. To anybody out there right now who's watching and listening to you and you're, uh, for the first time, what is it that you want them to take away? What is it that you want them to know? If I'm looking at anybody that's within influence within organizations or anything within the diversity, equity, inclusion, because that, that's I probably have a couple of things that I want to say, but I'm going to okay. start off by saying this. When you think about when I think about the, the equity, you know, the diversity, inclusion and equity. Right. Um, I always like to liken it on, back into Jackie Robinson. And I think um, I don't know when it was a couple of maybe been a week or two ago when uh, we were just coming on the 74th anniversary of when Jackie Robinson integrated into the MLB. And uh, I like to use that example because, you know, uh, people think about Jackie Robinson and they think about what he did and, uh, and they think about the LA Dodgers and they think about Branch Rickey, right? They think about Branch Rickey. 
well, you know what? Let me let me come back, right? Because there are three. I can use this example, and I could I can pivot it three different ways to talk to various different audiences. So, uh, talking about Jackie Robinson, right? Uh, I, I like to talk about you know anybody that's a, that's a black man or that's a minority or person of color that's entering into a, a workspace. I like to just ask them to look at Jackie Robinson and look what he was able to accomplish, right? And use that as a template for success and understanding that it's possible, understanding that, you know, you can do it and just, uh, there are many people that have done it before you and they'll just allow you to just operate and, and encourage you to operate in boldness, to operate in fearlessness, uh, to fear nothing, uh, let your light shine. You have something to contribute. You have something to give. I think that God put something inside of you. There's somebody out here that needs you to show that and you dimming your light does not help anybody. So uh, for anything, uh, I don't care whether it's systemic racism. I don't care if it's a if it's an environment that, that that you don't see a lot of people that look like you. Still, be encouraged to go forth, no matter what that looks like. And so, I want to use that as a way to just really encourage you to do so. Um, to leaders and uh, particular persons within organizations or in organizational spaces that have huge influences or significant influences. I like to people like to point out the story of Jackie Robinson and Jackie Robinson is usually the hero of that story. But many times we don't think about Branch Rickey, right? Who and is Branch, Branch Rickey, Rickey? Good question. <laughs> I have this book right here. Now. I mean, what's on this board? So Branch Rickey was the owner of the LA Dodgers organization and he was responsible for bringing, he was a white man. Here's Branch okay. Rickey. Can you help him pull the book? This is Branch Rickey right here. Yeah. I got a book what is called, called Branch, Branch? Rickey's. Little Blue Book. Branch Rickey's Little Blue Book, uh, Wit and Strategy from Baseball's Last Man, Last uh, Wise Man. It uh, just has a bunch of, uh, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I like to consider myself a voracious reader, but I really don't finish a lot of books. I'll read them halfway and throw and throw them somewhere and just somehow I'm think kind, that I'm, I'm kind of the all same. The in the book. Yeah. <laughs> Branch Rickey was the owner of the Los Angeles Dodgers, and he was the one, he was, he was a very innovative thinker, right? So when you think about integration into these workspaces, when you're thinking about diversity, inclusion, and equity, it's, it's, it's a form of innovation. You know, mm -hmm. you're bringing in something into your organization that hasn't been done before. And so at the end of the day, Branch Rickey, for bringing Jackie Robinson into his organization, was not just rewarded with a pat on his back. You know what he was rewarded with? Championships. He was rewarded with a world-class organization. He was rewarded with a brand of an organization that has stood the test of time that even today, they, they're still our work, a world-class organization and a winning organization. He was able to allow one of the best baseball players to come into the game and display talent and allow the world to see talent that has never ever been seen before and that was able to help innovate not only the game of baseball but the way and the style that baseball had been played right uh that was able to show as a template of integration or a template of equality right a template of what you can do or what would happen if you give an african-american an equal playing field and, and america was able to use that right it, it spread you know other teams saw the talent and they're like okay wait a minute let me go into the negro leagues and get some of this talent because here's the thing jackie robinson wasn't even the best player <laughs> there were there were there were players that were better than him right mm -hmm. jackie robinson was the best person that branch ricky saw that had the temperament to be able to go through what he was going to have to go through in order to be the first person to be Ooh. in the, the the major league baseball league with 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 predominantly white teams, predominantly white people watching, white pitchers throwing the ball at your head on TV, and the success uh, and and the future of other African Americans joining into the league is all riding on your shoulders. So Jackie Robinson did that and was able to not only just do well, even if he did average, <laughs> that would have been acceptable, but he was able to exceed the expectations and do great and, and and help his organization win championships so at the end of the day uh to organizations that are looking for diversity and equity and inclusion this is not just to meet some artificial quota and say oh okay we got some black guys on the team yeah we've got black women on the team or african-americans or minorities on the team no 
there's a certain level of innovation that you're bringing into a company. There's a certain skill set that you're bringing into a company. There's a certain level of incentive that you're bringing into a company when you bring in minorities into a company and you're not just going to be rewarded with pats on your back. You're going to be rewarded with top tier level talent and you're going to be rewarded with a winning and world class organization and you're going to be rewarded with proverbial championships in whatever industry that you're in. So that's my message when I'm advocating for diversity. I'm not going there just saying, hey, Give us a give us a chance. I'm I'm really more like a salesman, and right. I'm telling and I'm showing take people the what hero African story. Them. Take the hero yeah. story. I'm putting exactly. it in your hands. Exactly, and and I'm telling you, yeah, it's not just about doing you know because a lot of people think that that you know I think a lot of times leaders or people in, in organization when they're addressing diversity, it's more on a on a sympathy level, like yeah. oh yeah, we know that you blacks have done bad, and uh, yeah, yeah, you know what, a, this is you've right. Had a look, hard time. Yeah, you've had a hard time. We've got to make it right for you. And they're not recognizing that, no, not only are you you're not necessarily doing them a favor, you're doing yourself a favor, right? And there's going to come a time, you know, in the industries, no matter what it is, where globalization is going to take place, consolidations is going to take place. And when you look at companies, right, the companies that are leading within their particular industries right now are companies that have focused a certain level on diversity, right? And they are even behind the eight ball to an extent, right? But you're gonna have to begin fo focusing in, on diversifying your talent base because it's all about talent, right? You don't wanna cut yourself off from a whole talent pool of great people, right? With these diverse skill sets, all because you are not willing to cut off the, or, or, or to come against many of the biases that have been established in your organization or to unclog many of the pipelines within your organization that hinder talent from uh, freely flowing through there because of the effects of systemic racism and, 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 and segregation, right? And so that's what I wanna, wanna say, you know, we, we don't just need Jackie Robinsons, we need Jackie Robinsons that are, are, are willing to step up and play and, and serve as leaders. Uh, within these predominantly uh, workspaces and, and more Harriet Tubman's that are willing to mm -hmm. get into these workspaces and, and, and achieve a certain level of success, but not be afraid to go and reach back, right? But also we need some modern day branch rickies. We need modern day branch rickies that are innovators. We need modern day branch rickies that are leaders. And we need modern day branch rickies that are forward thinkers to understand and being able to go in these particular places that have been unchartered. Um, when I look at Branch Ricky, he went into the Negro Leagues, right? What does that look like in organizations? You should have some level of pipeline within your organization where you are going to historically black colleges and universities and intentionally seeking out the talent that is there within spaces, especially working spaces. I've had many white, not many white guys, but I've had some white guys come to me as we're talking about sports, right? When you get to, men are gonna talk about sports and a lot of times it doesn't matter whether it's a white guy or a black guy, that's where we're gonna bond at. We're gonna be talking about sports and that's where we're gonna, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna wrestle, we're gonna debate, we're gonna throw some, we're gonna agree, we're gonna laugh. And that's usually where I find a bond with many uh, of my white counterparts within these workspaces. And I've had some white counterparts tell me that, you know, they've admitted to me that, you know, hey, um, I actually do, you know, think that blacks are the best athletes. And I get what they're trying to say, and I understand it, but I don't want anybody to make the mistakes just thinking that blacks are just excelling in athletics because there's something genetically different about us and that our muscles grow higher like blacks aren't just dumb jocks that are just playing sports all their life when you look really looking at somebody excelling athletically what you're really looking at somebody is somebody ex ex excelling intellectually mm -hmm. you're seeing them ex excelling innovatively in their mind once you really get to the higher level of sports and you start really understanding the game what do they always tell you well you may not know <laughs> because as you say <laughs> you tell me what stuff. is it <laughs> but what <laughs> but what they say is that you know they say the game is it's, it's 40 percent physical but 60 percent mental right okay. baseball is like 90 percent mental and 10 percent physical you're seeing somebody excel mentally and you're seeing an exhibition of what blacks can do mentally and innovatively like when you're seeing michael jordan make these different types of shots and reverse layups yeah there's an athletic piece to that but there's a certain level of mental creativity and innovation that comes with that and that's what you're really looking at and that's the greatness that you're looking at when you look at african-american athletes out there and why are they able to do that because that's one of the few places that we've been giving a level playing field 
where we are not having anybody stopping from what we're doing. You know, you, you, there, there's no closed door. It's an extremely transparent environment. So a and referee there's just pipelines. Can't, there's literally there's pipelines. pipelines. A referee just can't call a travel on a black player because he's black, right? You're going to have some black people. You're going to have some white people, some Hispanic people. You're going to have some Asian people, some Indian people that are rooting for this team that are mad at you because, you know, they may not, you know, yeah. even, even though they may not be seeing color or even more than color, what they're seeing is the color of their team's jersey. So you're not just going to be able to just openly cheat. And that's what sports has given African-Americans. Right. But I'm saying that that same level of innovation right, that you've seen African-Americans display on the basketball court, on the football field, on the baseball field, and with any other sports arena that, and the many other sports arenas that you're seeing where there has been a level playing field. If you do the work in an organization to level the playing field, you're going to see that same level of innovation take place within that organizational space, and you're going to find so many diamonds uh, that have been hidden in the roughs, right? And you are definitely going to benefit as an organization for that. And so that's usually the, the perspective and the sales pitch that I present, you know, and so that, that that's my message to organizations. You know, you're not just doing, you know, African Americans a favor, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but you're putting yourself in a position to win, in a position to truly diversify your your, your talent pool and the level of talent that you have access to, because you're going to come and allow yourself to be accessible or have access to people that think differently, to act differently, and not only that, but have incentive, right? African-Americans, we've always been innovative because we've had to be innovative, right? We haven't had the resources, right? So we've had to operate with operational efficiency. We had to do more with less and, and to create something from nothing and really think, okay, how can I do this better? Because it's been incentive there, right? And mm -hmm. so that's what we do. Even in slavery, if you look at if you look at all of the inventions from the traffic light to the gas mask, Lewis Latimer, they say that he invented the filament that put the light bulb in, but I'll just say that he was a very pivotal piece within the light, the actual light bulb, you know, Benjamin Banneker and what he did and actually designing Washington, D.C. Um, I can just go on and on and on and on and on. I'll be here for 30 more minutes and I don't want to bore you, but talking about uh, the inventions that African-Americans have made, right? And what we didn't get credit for, right? These would have been businesses that would have been, that would have grown and blossomed into million and billion dollar industries today. Um, but the point that I'm saying is that, you know, a lot of times African-Americans have been likened unto a level of physical and athletic success. But that is such a, 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 a disservice and, and, and a wrong way of thinking of what we bring to the table. There is yeah. a level of innovation that what our true power and our true talent. Our, I believe that different cultures have different cultural talents, right? There, there, there are certain cultural skill sets that are just developed in, in, in various cultures because of, you know, what you've been exposed to as a culture, what you've been exposed to as a people. What we specialize in as African-Americans is innovation right and operational efficiency so if you want to bring that into your organization that's what you're bringing into your organization when you go and you intentionally seek out african-american talent and you level do the work to level the playing field to make sure that once that african-american is in your organization that they can operate and work freely without being hindered by systemic racism or biases in place you said um there was a third group that you wanted to speak to yeah, you know, there probably wasn't a third group that I wanted to speak to, but just to anybody that's watching this, even if you're not not a third group that I wanted to speak to, but the third point that I wanted to make, you're good. I'm, you listened through all that and you were able to compartment up <laughs> because I said a lot. That's how I know that you're good at what you do. But the last thing that I want to say is that, you know what, honestly, um, God is real and anything with God is possible, man. So to anybody, you know, whether or not you're in an organization, no matter what space you're in, I want to just encourage you to continue to keep going continue to keep fighting, don't ever give up, continue to get better and and, and just just let, let your light shine. There's greatness inside of you. And uh, I'm not just saying that, but I truly do believe that there's a certain level of genius, level of talent inside of everybody. And we just have to sort of find our purpose and find the right space that we're supposed to operate in. And once we're in that right lane, it'll go, you know, and, 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 and it'll show. And I think a lot of times throughout our life, we have a lot of things that are hindering us from getting there and a lot of obstacles along the way, but uh, nothing beats consistency. 
Nothing beats mm-hmm. consistency. If you think about a drop of water and how streams are created within mountains, it's because a little drop of water from rain is coming into mountains and it's literally wearing that rock down. One drop of water is wearing that rock down. A drop of water compared to a mountain, right? It has no effect, but with consistency from that droplet of water, it will cause even mountains to move. Uh, so that brings me back to a Bible verse when it talks about a mustard seed of faith and how mountains can be moved with that mustard seed of faith. You know, that mustard seed, uh, your faith is going to be connected to consistency. And with your consistency from that faith, you're going to be able to move mountains too, maybe even literally move mountains. <laughs> so uh, that's my message to everybody. Man, Jeremy, this was good. I can't wait till this one comes out. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you. No, it Thank was, uh, you. It was very fun. That's fine. Thank you for having me on the fact that, I, you know, what I've always kind of been dreamed of being interviewed. And uh, it's crazy because people think I'm nuts, but I will walk down the street and I'll answer questions to myself. Like I'll ask myself questions and I'm like, how am I going to answer this question? And I'll answer this question. So what we're doing right now is is truly a manifestation of me walking down the street looking like a crazy person in LA talking to myself and probably just even younger when I was in Chicago talking to myself. (laughs) People didn't know what I was doing. I do this. I love talking to people and understanding what's in your mind. Um, yeah. How do you think about the world? How do you see the world? What's going on in your world? Do you see this yeah. the same way I see this? Like that exactly. to me is important. That to me is where I feel like how we connect, how we understand yeah. each other, how we move and, and the moves that we want to make. We can only know that if yeah. you're in relationship with people, if you understand people, yeah. if you listen yeah. to people. You know what? And I know this is a cliche statement, you know, especially when we're talking about diversity, equity, inclusion and racism. Like when you really get to when you really get to like know people and learn people, like you start really finding out that we have more in common than we have different. Like everybody is at some way, shape, form or fashion. You're going to be into some level of self-preservation. Everybody wants to eat. Everybody wants to sleep. Everybody wants to take care of their family and everybody wants to succeed. And the thing is, is that, you know, when we're fooled into believing that there's not enough room for everybody to succeed and we think that this if this person succeeds and that's going to take away from my ability to succeed, that's when things start getting fuzzy and that's when things, you know, the conflict truly begins. But at the end of the day, um, we're all out here uh, just trying mm-hmm. to make it better, not only for ourselves and for our families. And so I think we truly do have much more in common than we do have different. And I'm, I'm willing to just go. And, and fight to explore those commonalities as opposed to uh, letting those differences hinder me from where I want to go. Yeah, like we we know what divides us. We 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 know what divides yeah. us, but what unites us? You know, like yeah. you said, sports, yeah. food, yeah. culture, yeah. travel, yeah. money. We we all want the same thing. <laughs> we want to eat, yeah. and we want to eat well, yeah. and we want to look good doing yeah. it. <laughs> right? Like yeah, yeah. Wow. Well, Jeremy, thank you. Thank you for your insight. Thank you for sharing your perspective. I I love this conversation. I love the takeaways from this conversation. I love the fact that you're focusing not just from your perspective as as a man, as a professional, as um, a person of color. I love the fact that you're saying no, and you're you're speaking to organizations and and what the the Ricky. Ricky Branches, what was his name? <laughs> no, Branch Ricky. Branch, Branch Ricky. Ricky. No, and you got it. It was just backwards at all. When you said Ricky Branch, Branch I, I got mixed up. I started thinking of Ricky Bobby. I'm like, it's Ricky. I'm like, <laughs> Branch Ricky, though. Yeah. And you're also Branch speaking Ricky. to the Branch Rickies, man. I yeah, love it. Yeah. 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 Because I've come into contact with some Branch Rickies, and uh, uh, I have a few Branch Rickies in my life. And so, yeah, we, we need some more, though. We definitely need some branch rookies. We need Jackie Robinson and branch rookies to create yeah. winning organizations all the way around. So it's a two, it's a, it's a dual sided thing there, a dual sided mm-hmm. effort. Well, thank yeah. you for being part of this conversation. And I can't thank wait for, for the next me. one. Let's do it. Thank you for listening to Tuesdays with Andrea. There are hundreds of thousands of podcasts out there, and I appreciate you making the time to listen to mine. If you like this show and want to know more, check out TuesdaysWithAndrea.com or please leave a review on iTunes or drop a line in the YouTube comment section. Until next time, please stay kind in your mind, nice on the web, and stay hella hopeful in your heart.